Hello, everybody. Welcome to WD Carousel of Podcast. My name's Crystal. And I'm Ian. And today we are going to do another animator spotlight. You're going to be seeing that we're going to be doing these a little bit more regularly because we think these guys need a little bit of attention, a little bit of love. And mm-hmm. so we are going to continue on with our original animators, Imagineers series? Yeah. Question mark? Yeah. Sort of thing? Um, non, yeah, traditional, not contemporary sort of, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we haven't actually discussed any of the nine old men before we've brought up quote unquote the nine old men but right. even <laughs> you know our our last animator spotlight you know he he wasn't one of the nine old men right i mean which this is, is really weird that ub iWorks isn't but you know <laughs> right. well he kind of always was kind of around the fringes so i kind of yeah. kind of get it and he but, left yeah. and came back and Either way, if you have any interest in that episode, go ahead. It's in our library. But today we are going to be discussing Mark Davies. Now, Mark Davis yes. is actually um, one of the most, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, one of the most okay. influential people and animators in the Disney world. Wow. I don't know what else to say. Um, yeah. I was just, as I kept doing more research, there, I just kept finding more and more and more that were huge things that not only did he have his fingers on, but he was instrumental for doing, providing, creating. Yeah. That okay. I, I can't see the Disney company being the same without him, which sure. yeah. also it makes sense then why... Walt actually referred to him as the Renaissance man. Like Walt could literally say, Hey Mark, I need you to do this. And Mark would figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start uh, back at the beginning. And so this is the beginning of the actual, the, the Disney company. So we're not yeah. getting into early iterations of the company. Mark joined the Disney company in 1935, his first production that he worked on, he was actually an assistant to another animator. He didn't have the cred clout behind him to be able to, you know, have his, have his full name on there, but he was actually credited with part of the snow white movie that he worked on as Mm. an assistant. And it's a part that everybody's very familiar with. It's Snow White dancing with the dwarves. And that happy little night where, you know, they have the oompa, 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 and all the dancing that happened. I'm, I'm failing right. at this, but everybody knows what I'm talking no. about when yeah. I'm saying so, that Snow White yeah. dancing with the dwarves. Dwarves, yeah. <laughs> Either way, that was his first it's credited scene. It's an iconic scene. piece of animation, yeah. Yeah, that was his first <laughs> credited scene in any film. And yeah. so that was a huge thing. But what he was a real expert on was drawing animals. He spent, they, uh, I was watching an interview that he did and he said that he spent more time in a zoo than even the animals did. Just trying <laughs> to figure out how to draw them, draw them really realistically, listically, why stick them? words and (laughs) he liked you know being able to figure out their physicality and their bone structure to make them you know accurate as possible Mm -hmm. and so when the movie bambi came around they originally offered him the position of a storyboard illustrator so that way he could create the story and lay it out for the rest of the production cast to be able to figure out okay well what scenes are we doing how did we want to have this visual what's going on here and Walt actually liked his drawings so much that he wanted to see Mark's animation on the big screen he said so then it came to the point of uh, he started actually working as a big screen animator no longer just doing the storyboarding and so he learned a lot he said and one of the scenes in Bambi that he said he learned the most on was the part where Bambi meets Flower for the first time so nosing Hmm. through the flower bed and then bumping noses and then Flower comes up through the flower bed and how it was so important to have the correct angle so that way you got the um, image of the skunk from behind but you got to see the shock on Bambi's face and how it wouldn't have been the same if it would have come from any other direction. 
And right. so he really learned a lot through that. I'm going to try and run through this as fast as possible because Mark has such a big catalog of work. Uh, but there are documentaries out there that D23 did an hour long special on him. There is the Disney family um, series that came out in the 80s that did a special on him, a half an hour special. There is the Renaissance Man book for Mark, as well as a new tabletop double book that came out too. So I am going to go through this as fast as possible, but just like everything, go look at your resources. There's plenty out there. Yes. Then Walt offered him the lead animation uh, animator position for the Victory Through Air Power, which was the World War II propaganda movie that came the out sure. based on the you know record setting book. And Walt trusted him enough to do that. Went to Song of the South, and this is where they worked a lot with the Brer animals. So Brer Bear, Brer Rabbit, Brer Fox. And that's where he played more with human human style but with animal characters. So you saw a lot oh. more humani humanisms, I'm just going to say, walking yeah. on two legs, wearing clothes, yep. chit-chatting, but still had a few of the same animal characteristics, yeah. obviously. Am Fox anthropomorphic. Yeah, yeah, Fox wanted to eat the rabbit, and those sorts of things, but sure. really played up with the more human aspects of animation and illustration. Right. And that's when he got into the ladies. Um, he's also known as a ladies man but not in the way that most people are known as ladies man <laughs> now uh he became one of the go-to animators for any female characters his first start was cinderella and he had talked about in one of the documentaries that i saw um they had been interviewing him and he said that it was so hard to do cinderella because he didn't understand the human anatomy i mean he did but he knew that right. people were going to be hyper focused on it because when you look at a human you know what to expect from a human mm -hmm. not as much mm -hmm. as an animal so if you round out something if you kind of have a joint bend the other direction because it makes more character sense nobody's going to be like oh my You're gosh versus that. if you right. were to have like our knees go backwards that's a huge thing so right. he knew that right. his character was going to be under a spotlight and that's why cinderella was so hard for him but walt even said that his favorite piece of animation actually came from cinderella and specifically it was the transformation of cinderella going mm. from the rags to the ball gown and yeah. so walt if he says that that's his favorite piece of animation ever and yeah. you created I mean, you can feel a little good about yourself yeah, right? yeah exa right? exactly um he did alice for alice in wonderland he said that one was difficult because a lot of the side characters were being animated by such big animators that had a lot of character and didn't want to outshine or didn't want to have the right. side characters outshine um, the main right. character. So again, that was a little bit more difficult. Tinkerbell originally was supposed to just be a glowing ball of light. And he's the one that actually made her into a seductive pixie. And then had to figure Classic. out how to portray emotions and everything without the talking. Because remember, Tinkerbell doesn't talk. So having to figure out how to mime... Yeah, she had to she had to mime animation. everything. But yeah. you can kind of do that with animals too. So I mean, he might have had a little so bit it, of a leg up there. I don't know. Initially, was she gonna be <laughs> like the little glowing orb from like I one of the, so. I can't remember which I Zelda think thing so. it was. Hey, listen, like the little like anyway. Yeah, but then um, <laughs> they they talked about him, especially the part where she lands on the mirror and she's like looking at her body, and he's like, "Yeah, I tried to make her seductive but adorable." <laughs> sure i was like okay yeah i can see that but it's, yeah it was just a cute little add-on he did aurora from <laughs> she's seductive but small seductive but adorable um oh, yeah he did aurora from sleeping beauty he also did maleficent from sleeping beauty this is where oh, wow. he got into the villains um aurora sure, yeah. he did a lot more stylized moving illustration they had taken a whole different animation approach for visuals on this one which i think okay. we had slightly touched base on before I think um, a little bit yeah but so it was just something completely different maleficent he said that he even went to his personal library of art 
books that he had collected and got inspired by this medieval piece of art that had this um, all black outfit with, you know, that had like the diamonds cut out of it that looked like flames and the color he meant to make it look like a bat. And then, of course, she had to have, you know, horns because she was evil. (laughs) So it, it was it was really interesting hearing him build on this. And then he's his last character that he's known for animating is Cruella from 101 Mm. Dalmatians he said that one was just so much fun because even though she was evil she was hilarious to work with oh yeah and like the explosions and the this and the that and it was it was it was really exciting to see him be so you know enthusiastic about a character that he did yeah after that Walt pulls him aside and says I need you for a different project so that's when he starts the 1964 World's Fair. Wow. And he had his fingers in everything. All four of the attractions. Wow. And one thing you and I talked about a little bit when we did Mary Blair's Spotlight, when mm-hmm. we told, you know, when we admitted that she was huge in Small World, she did a lot of the yeah. coloring and concepts, the set designs, but it was actually Mark Davis that came up with the character designs themselves of the simplistic round faces oh. and a okay. lot of the... Uh, posing animation so like the dutch kids inside the tulips with their shoes hanging out doing the clicky clacky thing (laughs) um the leprechaun dancing you know geese talk a lot of the sketches that he did ended up being actually in the attraction i see so so he was a lot more he was basically like kind of like the animator (laughs) exactly (laughs) like he kind of he was the animator and she was the world builder sort of yeah and so unlike some of our other imagineers that we've discussed so like of iWorks where he just completely stopped touching a pencil and went into the physical thing really mark davis actually kept going with the animation but he created drawings for 3d characters so he didn't actually get into the nitty-gritty of how do you carve this out of clay how do you do this it was still concept art and concept design but it moved from a 2D format into a 3D format and trying to figure out how to make that work. He was still an animator designer, but he just completely translated what he applied it to. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, that's really in interesting. The Ford motorway, which doesn't exist anymore. He did a caveman no. <laughs> section in there. Um, oh. The great moments with Mr. Lincoln. He actually tried to figure out the mechanical components to make Lincoln move. And okay. <laughs> like they have an image, an image of one of his sketches where it's a hand and you can see like all the pulley joints and everything on it. And then he oh was like, God. uh, but yeah, I, I kind of planned this. So he'd be able to actually walk and stuff. And I guess we didn't need to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, but we got overboard. it to work, but we got it to work. And, you know, right. reviewers were saying I could have sworn he st- you know sat up stood up and then went walking across the stage when you know right. he didn't but no. it was part of the whole thing and he was also part of carousel of, Pro- of progress got it right, you got um, it. You got it right. <laughs> as well so he had his fingers in everything and yeah. after the 1964 world's fair walt asked him if he would be willing to become a full-time imagineer for the disneyland park And I heard him say, again, in one of the interviews that he did, he's like, before I showed up, nobody was laughing at Disneyland. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's pretty funny. (laughs) And so he he credits himself. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is... uh, a huge nod to him as well because he yeah. does focus on visual gags and the first mm-hmm. attraction that he worked on was kind of a revamp slash building of a redo they had a layout already but he came in and tweaked it a little bit of the jungle cruise mm, where okay. he wanted to add like this man-eating plant and it almost looked like a roly <laughs> crump sort of animation Design. and it was even got it. it got so far as to go into the model of the jungle cruise <laughs> but it was never yeah. actually put in instead it was put in with okay. singing frogs uh Classic. which hilariously were taken out just a few months later but the soundtrack was still in there so there was all this croaking and you couldn't tell what it was supposed to be 
Come be, that's so funny. <laughs> but he's the one who <laughs> came up with the gag of the safari, the trapped safari, where all of the safari people are up on that pole. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the rhino's there with his horn poking at one of them. And yep, he's like, that yep. is the first laugh that Disneyland ever got was that one section of the ride. <laughs> um, he talked about doing the elephants for the elephant pool area. And when Walt did a walkthrough, Mark was like, is, is this too many elephants? I, I feel like this is too many elephants. <laughs> <laughs> and Walt's like, no. And he's like, but nobody's going to, they're not going to be able to see it the first, you know, the first time through. And he's like, okay, well then they'll come back a second time or oh, a third funny. time. And that's right. where um, Mark decided to really pack things in mm -hmm. once he was kind of given that freedom of you don't have to make it just the one time shot like you right. did in animation where, right. you know, you you're only going to see it yeah. um, in the theater that once and then you technically then wouldn't have been able to see it again. So you wanted to pack as big of a punch as possible into the sure. important parts. They were, they were, at that point, they were totally changing the landscape of storytelling. It's just like what happened with when they made VR video games, that you started to have to consider looking at things that no one had looked at before, you know, mm -hmm. like going from that 2D, you know, animation to going to like, you're physically in a location, you can totally just go as ham as you want, and it's still good. Yeah, so, that's interesting. So we're going to up the ham a little bit more. And this is where we All get right. into the Tiki Room. So Good. using his experience in animal animation, he really worked on the concept art based on real anatomy. So some of his original sketches were like cuckoo bat crazy. Um, they honestly look like Dr. <laughs> Seuss characters. Good. But he pulled it back and he was like, this is a show that we want to have built on a series of surprises. So for those of you who have been in the Tiki Room, it starts out with, yeah, you see the four main birds and you see them sitting on their perch and you expect them to talk and then a little bit. And then the next thing comes on or, you know, these plants get a light on them and then start singing. And then all of a sudden the walls join in and right. it was just one thing after another, after another. And right. through the research that he did in this, he actually became one of the biggest New Guinea collectors in the world like of, oh, of like of stuff yeah. yeah like spiritual masks and replicas right. and all of this stuff from papua new guinea <laughs> oh, funny. It's, it's hilarious and so i mean in all of the research that i've done i've seen pictures of like his living room and every single square inch of the walls has something on it some sort of <laughs> new guinea paraphernalia something he collected that's <laughs> exactly so um then he moved on to pirates and uh, Pirates, yes. obviously, was originally supposed to be a wax museum walkthrough attraction. Right. But this is where he decided he was going to play up the character along with the realism okay. for okay. the Pirates. So it wasn't just, urgh, Pirates. And he started by trying to originally go with Pirates that they might have been familiar with. So Blackbeard, uh, I don't know any other Pirates, but, you know, those <laughs> sorts of th There was one I think I saw that was called Douglas. I don't know. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, why not? Why not? Uh, he also had the original concept of female protagonists. And so oh. they had two main female Pirates, Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed, who were supposed to be like the Pirate Queen which makes me go back to our very first episode where mm -hmm. I'm getting mad that they're changing the redhead into a pirate queen. But I find <laughs> out that they actually were supposed to have originally pirate queens. Pirate. That's interesting. It's very 100, interesting. 124 episodes in and we're <laughs> seeing it all come full circle. I mean, it's just how much of what we see now used to be old mm -hmm. concepts even he had talked about like one of the sketches that he did with the female pirates had these mm -hmm. skeletons in the background that he reused later that ended up being like the skeleton area of the ride so you know that part sure. when you came through and there's like the skeleton on the wall with the saber through his belly and like the yeah. hat cockeyed that was one of his sketches yeah. originally with oh, the funny. ladies sure oh, and so funny. they still used it um, this is right. also where he kind of went uh, nuts on the visual gags. <laughs> so like everywhere oh. that you look on Pirates of the Caribbean, and anybody who's been on the ride can attest to this, it is like jam-packed full of like visual goodies. 
Mm -hmm. You look in this little corner, you look in this little section, you're going to find something new. Yeah. Um, One of his original concept gags was to have a shadow on the fort wall that was supposed to be someone sneaking by, but they couldn't figure out how to originally do it. And the reason why I'm, I'm... put it on here is because last time i did the pirates of the caribbean ride in florida they figured it out for the halloween um overlay oh yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah what was a, an original concept that they weren't able to figure out because of tech technology at the time they still brought to life how many years later yeah oh that's amazing huh yeah, he also focused on uh what he called storytelling poses for the characters so that way if something happened with the mechanicals of the animated or the audio animatronic it would stop in a pose because it was already sculpted that way that you could still get the intent of the character the quick read of the character so you knew exactly what that person was supposed to be doing at that time regardless if it was actually moving or not in that like in the engineering world like failing safe is like it fails into a position that that means it's it's safe but in this case it's failing into a position that still tells the story Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like the same the same thing yeah it's clever he also was around long enough to work on the florida version in walt disney Mm. world and he actually rewrote the ending to that one and he says that he likes it better just because there's more visual um okay visual things to look at while you're waiting so yeah for you because you haven't been to the california version yet when you come to the end you go up the ramp and it's a slow climb up the ramp and you're riding up that whole time Mm -hmm. and so you have nothing to look at there's nothing going on it's kind of boring he says and so he wrote the end of the florida attraction to have that room with all the treasure and stuff that you wait in while the cart in front of you or whatever how many boats are unloading so you can still look at stuff but then you're immediately getting out of the boat and then it's going up that like super speed ramp (laughs) to get the boat back to the top of the hill that's that's freaky (laughs) so he liked that one better because it gave you more stuff to look at instead of just wading up this slow slow little climbing hill at the end Mm mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Uh, he also was going to be included in the Thunder Mesa project that never actually happened. Um, they were going to be doing right. the Western River Expedition. He was going to again pair up with Mary Blair. And this okay. was going to be focused kind of like Pirates, but movie musical version of the West. Um, they even oh, went God. so far as to have not just concept art, but modeling done and um then the Western or the Thunder Mesa project was scrapped, as you and I know. Um, yeah. And then the final project that he worked on that I'm going to bring up right now is the Haunted Mansion. Ah, uh, yes. Now, he wasn't originally on this project. He already, there, there had already been like Rolly Crump and others that we will be bringing up in future Imagineering episodes. Mm-hmm. Um but he came in and he took what was such a serious haunted house and (laughs) tried to add the visual gags in there again and this is where we had talked a little bit i think about the fight between the original like scary haunted house and then the we're funny ghosts section of (laughs) the, the haunted mansion Right. But he did a lot of the visual gags. So he is responsible for, checklist please, hitchhiking ghosts, the hatbox ghost, the bride, uh, a squeaky door ghost, which even went so far as to actually have an audio animatronic made. It was just never input into the house. Um, He was responsible for the changing portraits, the ones that the lightning flashes and they (gasps) have a completely different thing. And the stretch room paintings, which are the most iconic part of the ride, I would feel. Oh, yeah. As far as people recognize Mm -hmm. those, like just anywhere. Yeah. Um, I saw his concept art for like the bride move from this supposed to be see through ghost where you saw her heart, her brain, and she was holding a candle. And then it slowly progressed here and there. And literally, once the audio animatronic was made before the ride opened, somebody decides to throw a veil and a flower bouquet in her hand and all of a sudden it was the bride 
<laughs> that wasn't the original intent. That was not the original intent. <laughs> but um, yeah, he was so like influential on this ride. Everybody knows those characters that I'm talking about here. Like, even if yeah. you're not familiar with the Haunted Mansion, you might know who the Hatbox Ghost is or the Hitchhiking Ghosts. Because yeah. they're just so iconic Disney. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's important that we give him acknowledgement, especially for the amount of work that he did. But it's just I, I tried to keep this under a half an hour. <laughs> I don't want to overwork people, but basically right. anything that you find that is I'm I'm gonna I'm going to try and give you a visual as far as his characters go in attractions. If you're finding something that looks like it could be a caricature, so those mm -hmm. character drawings that you see on fairs and where you might go to a festival and get one done, where they really emphasize certain parts of your face, so like the jowls or the eyes or something like that. I'm looking to the sure. side because I literally have the stretch room portraits right there hanging on my wall. Right. Anything that you see like that is probably due to Mark Davis. Huh. Wow. So. And that's ev that stuff's everywhere. Yeah. In the in the park. Also, he worked so. on Country Bears and America Sings. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. And you know how much I love Country Bears. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I mean, he has such a huge catalog of material that he's created and projects that he's done. And it's not just small things. It's not just like one thing here, one thing there. Right. These are hugely iconic pieces of the disney company like yeah. could you could you imagine what what alice would look like right if he didn't have the same sort of stylization but now that i've said those characters you know you can kind of look at cinderella alice aurora mm -hmm. and kind of see the connection between them mm -hmm. in animation styles yeah, absolutely. You can see the same kind of connection between the villains like Maleficent and Cruella. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. There's definitely some very iconic um, stylization that he does. Mm -hmm. Look at the animals. Yeah, Brer Bear versus the country bears. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. Like, the more you say that, like, there's these very like specific kind of silhouettes and 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 animation kind of movements that it, I can like close my eyes for like a specific, like for a couple of villains and I can like superimpose them over and I can kind mm -hmm. of see a couple of those influences of his on them. Also why it's do you have to draw everybody blonde? All of his well, heroines are blonde. That's something that we can... <laughs> of course, there's not really too him, many heroines that have red hair. They started in the 80s. I'll, I'll give props to, you know, Ariel, kind of. Yeah, um, With kind of. being the first redhead. But <laughs> I think there needs to be more redhead, you know. I think you're right. Anyways, <laughs> that's, just, yeah. that's just me. That's just me. But yeah, yeah. this has been Mark Davis. I mean, oofed. Yeah, he's he's got a lot. But yeah, this yeah, has been yeah a big one. And I hope you were able to handle the full 30 minutes. But this has been <laughs> WD Carousel of Podcast. My name's Crystal. And I'm Ian. And we hope you have a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Bye.